I was going to take you through chapters 5 and 6. I mean, I, I was, I'm taking you through chapter 5 because there is so much that the Lord was putting on my heart in chapter 5 that I knew that I would not do service to chapter 6, which is the fall of Jericho. And so what we're looking at will be chapter 5 and its preparation. I want to show you some things here in chapter 5 that I believe can be of help to us as believers. For those who are in leadership, there are some very basic leadership principles here. For those who are aspiring to leadership, you can learn some things by, by looking at this chapter. And for those who have no sense of desiring to, to quote-unquote, lead in, in, a, um, in a sense in a, in a church, doesn't mean that you can't be a leader wherever God places you. And so this can be of help to all of us tonight. So let's begin reading here in chapter 5. And what I'll do is I'll read just verse 1, give the introduction, then we'll move into verses 2 to conclude uh, this chapter at uh, verse 15. So let's read verse 1, Joshua chapter 5. We read, So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted. There was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. Now chapter 5, as we look at this chapter, contains insights into the conquest of the promised land. And we're going to see some very basic things related to Joshua's establishment as leader over the nation of Israel. We're also going to be seeing uh, what the Lord would require of His people if they're going to enter into His promises. The people are going to need to be consecrated. And that consecration will be revealed through the, the uh, rite of circumcision. The people are also going to celebrate Passover, which will remind them of God's works in the recent past. And then Joshua is going to receive his commissioning when he speaks to the commander of the, the, the Lord's hosts. And so we're going to be seeing this as, as the children of Israel are, are being prepared to enter in and to uh, take the land that God had promised them. Now, word of Israel's entrance into this promised land had already begun to travel. It had traveled from the east to the west. That's what's being said here in verse 1. Because when you look at these peoples who are mentioned here, you notice that he speaks of the Amorites and he speaks of the Canaanites. The Amorites were a people group that were there by the Jordan on the eastern border of um, what we call Israel today. And the uh, Canaanites were people who lived by the Mediterranean Sea. And so what you have here is you have word that is traveling from the east to the west. And uh, from the east to the west at the approximate deepest portion is about 70 miles and so this word that the children of Israel have entered in is traveling fast and it's already going through that particular region and uh, they're hearing the news uh, concerning the, the Jews entering in but what they're really hearing is concerning the fact and notice in verse 1 that, uh, that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over. So they've heard that God has done this incredible miracle. It's an obvious sign, an obvious miracle, that God is in the, in the midst of the nation of Israel. Now, as you read this, I was thinking, uh, just before I came tonight, I was listening to a commentator, not a Bible commentator, a uh, political commentator, Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly was speaking today to, uh, to a husband and wife who um, are the team that put together this, uh, this mini-series called The Bible that's going to come out uh, fairly soon. Looks pretty interesting to me. And so O'Reilly was interviewing them, and I wanted to hear their, um, their take on, on why they um, made this movie and what they expected to see uh, as a result of the, the series that they did related to the Bible I think there are some 10, 10 episodes from the Old Testament and 10 episodes from the New. And I wanted to hear where they came from. And so O'Reilly was asking some questions of them. 
he asked uh, the wife, her name was Rona, uh, if she took the Bible literally. I mean, are you saying these things that you've made into, into um, movie form, that you actually believe these things in a literal sense? And to her credit, she said, oh, indeed I do, absolutely. We wanted to make this, uh, this series in a way that brings honor to the Word of God. And, and uh, the husband was saying, uh, there is a terrible biblical illiteracy in the United States. He says, we have, we have American students graduating from college, going overseas to, to take jobs, and, and if they get in a conversation with somebody concerning biblical things, he said, they are completely ignorant of the Bible. He said, we really think that the Bible ought to be taught once again in schools. Even if it's just a form of literature, there are many who would believe that the Bible has so many valuable lessons to learn from it that it ought to be taught. And so that's what he was saying. He's saying, I think that the Bible ought to be taught in schools. Awaken the literacy of the American student because they're very ignorant of Scripture. And so I, I was listening, saying, well, amen to that. Amen. I think the Bible ought to be taught. Amen. And this and that, you know. But what was interesting was O'Reilly said, now, you don't really take it literally, do you? Now, again, O'Reilly is an individual who professes to be of the Christian faith. As a matter of fact, he's written some best-selling books. Some of you are aware of them, Killing Lincoln and Killing Kennedy. And perhaps you don't know, or maybe you do, or maybe you don't care, but I'm going to say it anyway. He um, is going to be bringing out uh, a book called Killing Christ. And so he's really on a killing spree. And so as, as he's writing these these books and all, he's trying to do it from a journalist's perspective. And so he's speaking and he's saying, you don't really take the Bible literally, do you? You don't really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, do you? You don't believe that the earth was actually created, that there was an Adam and an Eve, do you? And uh, I couldn't help but listen to this man as he was speaking. And I thought, how interesting that he would ask questions like that, which are typical of skeptics and not believers. Um, I learned a principle of biblical interpretation that I'll give to you right now. I learned it when I was a college student at Biola. It's very simple. When the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. So if it's not written with an obvious intention to be allegorical, when it's written to be looked at and to be read in a plain way, the best interpretation is to take it that way. So, in relation to Jonah, was Jonah swallowed by a great fish? Well, Jesus seemed to think so because, and you'll find this interesting, hopefully, when you, when you see Jesus speaking concerning his death, burial, and resurrection, he uses Jonah as his example. And that's where you get the three days from. It's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, even so the Son of Man will be in the, the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Jesus took Jonah literally. Jesus didn't present the story of Jonah as an allegory. He didn't do that. Some would argue, well, that's simply because he didn't have the knowledge that we have today. <laughs> yeah, you're smarter than God. But that's how it works, you see. Um, was creation a literal, literal event, or was it progressive over time? People argue over that. O'Reilly was wondering about that. You don't take that literally, do you? Well... Jesus was at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And they had run out of wine. And Mary, Jesus' mother, approached him and said, they have no wine. Jesus' response was very simple. Woman, what have I to do with you? My time hasn't come. Mary goes and gives him advice. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus says, go and get those water pots, fill them with water, then call the governor of the feast and give him a drink. And so Jesus instantly created what would normally take a process simply because he can create and he can do it instantaneously. 
Now listen, and I'm not going to call into question the faith that O'Reilly holds. I'm just using him as an example. If you don't believe that God create, can create the heavens and the earth simply because he's God, and if you don't believe that a great fish can swallow a man and yet the man can survive, then I wonder how you can believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's the greatest miracle that ever happened. Everything else pales by comparison to the resurrection of Christ. So how can you say you don't believe that a fish can swallow a man and the man can survive? How can you say you don't believe that God can create the heavens and the earth with his spoken word is instantaneously if he so desires, and yet you say you believe that God can raise the dead to life? It just doesn't make sense. I, I'm not in the habit of limiting God. I suspect God can do what God wants to do. And so if God wants to dry up the Jordan, well, these individuals, these Amorites and these Canaanites, they're not being, they're not being made afraid by an allegory. They're, they're afraid because of something that just happened, a miracle, an unbelievable miracle. The Jordan River, which was flooding its banks because, according to chapter 3, I think it was first verse 15, because it was the flood season. And so they would have thought that, well, because the Jordan is overflowing its banks right now, we have some time because we know the children of Israel are, are camped out there a few miles uh, east of the, of the Jordan. We know that, that because the Jordan is flooding over right now, that they're going to wait until the waters recede. But that's not what happens. What happens is God says, you ready? Okay, bang, dry up, here we go. And they're hearing about it, and, and the response is this tremendous fear that is taking place because they had thought that they would be given time to prepare for war, but it didn't happen that way. God dried up the Jordan in such a miraculous way that it produced a terror in them. Remember verse 24 of chapter 4, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. And that's why God did that, guys, so that, that the people would know that God is a mighty God. When God was speaking to Moses, when he raised him up to deliver the children of Israel, in Exodus 9, 16, God said to Moses, but indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And so when these people heard that God had dried up and made it possible for them to cross over the Jordan, well, there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel, because they knew that God was on their side. Now, verse 2, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who had come out had been circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. And so there is, there is a work that they have to do now. The Jewish men are now aware that the people of the land are in terror. They're aware of that because Rahab had made that very clear when the spies had come in and she had spoken to those spies and she had said to them that there was fear in the land. We saw it in chapter 3, verse 9, where, where she said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. And so at that time they were aware, the Jews were aware that the people of the land were in terror, as Rahab had already said. And so military strategists would more than likely believe it wise to invade while the people were afraid of them. But instead of going in, notice with me, God orders them to perform circumcisions on those who were uncircumcised. Why? Let me give you a ministry principle. Because before the campaign comes consecration. Before the campaign comes consecration. Circumcision is the emblem of the covenant God had made with Abraham. And this was a covenant that gave the promised land to the nation of Israel. All the way back in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 through 11, 
we read, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So God had established the sign of a covenant, which was to demonstrate that he would keep his promise to give them this land that they're about to enter in and to take. But the new generation had neglected the rite of circumcision during the years of wandering. The men of war had died in the wilderness. The boys born during that time remained uncircumcised. Circumcision represents their relationship to God, but they had not obeyed the voice of the Lord. Now, circumcision was never simply a cutting away of the flesh. Circumcision speaks of consecration. Circumcision represents the relationship to God, and the relationship they have with God is not to be just on the outside. The relationship that they have with God is to be one of the heart. So circumcision is not just a physical act of removing skin. Circumcision is deeper than that. It's spiritual because it represents a person's heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, it says, Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Be stiff-necked no longer. In the New Testament, in chapter 3, verse 3 of the book of Philippians, uh, Paul says, Or we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. And so before you enter into campaign, before you go into serving God, there needs to be a consecration of your heart. There needs to be a setting apart of your life for God. If you want to be used by the Lord and you want to inherit the promises of God, there is, a, there is a consecration, there's a devotion, there's an opening of your heart to the Lord, and there's a, a willing obedience to the things that he has commanded you. You see, before Israel faced their enemies, they needed to prepare their hearts. It says in verse 6 through 8, For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. And so Joshua circumcised their sons. If you expect to be used by the Lord, here's a ministry principle again. Consecrate yourselves to him. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 makes it very plain. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you want to be used by the Lord, Forsake the way of the world and pursue the Lord. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want to be used by the Lord? Don't be fighting and arguing all the time about what you're free to do. Don't be getting caught up with these arguments about all the things that I can still do and be saved. What you need to do is say, Lord, if there's anything in my life that keeps me from being used by you, then, Lord, may that be taken away. I yield it to you right now. I dedicate myself to you. I want to be used by you. After a crazy weekend in, in uh, Ensenada, back in 1973, Cinco de Mayo, 
I spent some time with my friends. I was already a Christian. I'd been a Christian for two years, a little over two years. And two of my friends were army buddies, and I went down to Ensenada for a weekend, Cinco de Mayo. We bought two cases of beer, and we drank them between the three of us before we got from Newport Beach to the San Diego border. By the time we got to Ensenada and started hitting the bars, we were already on our way to being totally drunk. And so we're doing the Boilermakers, or doing the tequila shots, or doing all of that. And we did that for three days. We bought Jose Cuervo. We had a Volkswagen van that had a giant moonroof kind of sunroof thing. I still remember standing up with a bottle of Jose Cuervo yelling at people, Jose's alive, I've got him in this bottle. I still remember doing that. Drunk for three days. A Christian. A Christian. Somebody says, oh, you just weren't saved because Christians don't drink. No, I was a Christian and I was drunk. Very drunk. And I came home. And my sister Madeline was in my parents' home and in the kitchen. And I walked in. I was 22 years old. And I walked into the kitchen very hungover. And she says to me, did you have a good time this weekend? And I said, I had a great time. Man, we were crazy for three days. Madeline, I had a great time. And then I broke down and began to sob. And I poured my heart out and I wept. And I said, God, be merciful to me. I am miserable. I've gone back to the world. I'm in sin. God forgive me. God forgive me. I went to church. There was an evangelist. His name was Mario Murillo. Perhaps some of you have heard his name. And Mario gave an invitation. And he said, there are people out here right now who are believers, who are living for the world and not for Jesus. And you're miserable and you need to get right with God. And if you're here right now and you need to get right with God, Mario said, stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. And I stood and I wept, and I said, God, forgive me, a sinner. I do not want to go back to the vomit that I have left, like the dog that returns to the vomit. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back like the pig returning to the mire that it's been washed from. I am a child of God. I'm not a dog, and I'm not a pig. I'm your son. Forgive me. That's how, not easy, it wasn't easy, but that's how quick it is when you actually humble yourself and say, God, forgive me. And from that point, that was in May, Cinco de Mayo weekend, in September of 1973 is when I started going to Biola because I said, I've got to do something with my life that honors God. I went to a Bible college, and in September of 1973, after a few months of rededicating my life to Christ, I started teaching a home Bible study in Norwalk, and this church really is the fruit of that small Bible study that took place back in 1973. 40 years ago in September, and that's because I made a decision to consecrate myself to God. I don't want the old world anymore. I don't want the old life anymore. I want to have the fresh life that comes through Jesus Christ. If you want to be used by the Lord, consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. It's interesting in verse 9 how it says, The Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. He says, I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt. In the latter years in Egypt, they had become slaves. And they were reproached. They were held in disdain by the Egyptians. They were ashamed. But now they're standing in the promised land. They've been free, freed by God. And so by way of application, when we're saved, we are freed. We're freed from bondage. And we are now established as free people in Jesus Christ. We are free in him. Like Paul says in Romans 6, 17 and 18, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. 
And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And so they were in bondage, but God rolled away that bondage. God rolled it away from them. And now they're standing there on the, on the shore there, the western shore of the Jordan. They're in that region there, and they're there as free people. Now, this new position will make it possible for you to wage spiritual warfare, and it makes it possible for you to become victorious. It's interesting how that it says in verse 8, so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Now, there's quite obvious reason for that. As they've gone through the painful action of circumcision, there's going to be a time where they're going to need to just recuperate so that they can actually be in condition to go in and, uh, and to war. But I would say this, and, and he who has ears, she who has ears, let you, I hope you hear this. Because not all people can receive what I'm about to say, and it's not because um, you're, you're unable to. It, it may be because you haven't come to understand this yet. But it's an absolute truth that all the old church fathers were well aware, aware of and, and uh, the better known uh, commentators of this age uh, are very aware of this, what I'm about to share with you. And it's this, sometimes consecration is accompanied by pain. Sometimes being set apart for the use to the Lord is accompanied by pain. When they received their circumcision, there was pain involved in that act of consecration. And, and this is where a lot of people, especially I'd say in the 21st century in 2013, this is where a lot of people, especially young believers or those who have, have yet to, to go through Scripture and see the whole counsel of God, this is where many have their difficulties because they have a difficult time believing that walking with the Lord is really something that may have a painfulness to it because they've been hearing so many messages that speak concerning that that God wants them to be the head, not the tail, that they don't understand that, uh, that you're, you're going to be conformed into the image of the one who has been referred to as the wounded healer. Jesus Christ suffered for us. And promises that we have in Scripture relate to the fact that there will be times of suffering that all people who follow Christ are going to endure. I, I wish I could stand, sit up here right now and say to you, guess what, man? If you're not walking with Jesus Christ, if you give your heart to him right now, I want to give you a promise from God. You will never have another lousy day in your life. You will always have a wallet full of money. You will never have any problems with your back or your face. You'll never have children. You'll never have any of the, the pain that accompanies life. It's all going to be so good. I just don't understand why you don't just give your heart to Jesus right now. How can you don't do that? Well, the bottom line is consecration is accompanied by pain. How do we know that? Well, one, they were consecrated, but they had to heal up. There was some pain involved in their circumcision. But sometimes consecration is accompanied by pain. Somebody once wrote, when God wants to drill a man, and thrill a man, and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that the world should be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him, and with mighty blows converts him into shapes and forms of clay which only God can understand. While man's tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, yet God bends but never breaks when man's good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with mighty power infuses, with every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. All you need to do is spend some time looking at some of the men that God uses, and you'll see what I'm saying. Abraham was given a tremendous promise. 
Your wife Sarah will conceive in her old age, and she will bear you a son. You shall name him Isaac, and in him all of my promises will be transferred. And yet what does God say to Abraham? Take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me. If you don't think that that command tore at the heart of Abraham, you haven't thought very deeply. Jacob, Jacob wrestled with an angel. And when he wrestled with that angel, and he wrestled all night, when it was time for the angel to, to leave, the angel reached and touched him, and, and his hip was out of place. And he became a cripple. And he limped for the rest of his life, remembering that encounter with God. Moses was on his way with his wife and sons, and the Bible simply says, and God sought to slay Moses. Elijah was pursued by an evil king and his wife. David hid in caves from those who pursued him. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel all suffered. Daniel was put in a lion's den. And you can multiply this over and over and over again. All you need to do is look at the, the original apostles, and 10 of the original 12 were martyred. The apostle Paul ultimately was beheaded. He's, he writes concerning the things that he's gone through, the whippings, the beatings, the times he's been over, overboard in, in, in the ocean, the various stripes that he had received and the jailings. He writes about them to the Corinthians. So sometimes consecration will include pain. Don't be surprised when, when, when it seems that things aren't going well for you. Don't, don't be surprised about, don't be surprised I'm not saying that you should go to bed tonight saying, God, would you please hurt me? I, I'm not saying that. I, I'm just saying, don't be surprised. Why? Because God will allow things into your life that break you so that the things that at one time were your joy and your pleasure will lose their luster so that your joy and pleasure is going to be transferred from things of this earth to those things which are above. And heaven becomes a more glorious place, and heaven becomes a greater desire and a stronger appetite than any other pleasure or any other place on earth. And the Lord has a way of doing that. Consecration sometimes is accompanied by pain. Don't be upset at the Lord when things aren't going the way you want them to go. Because God has a way of working out his pleasure and conforming you into his image through these things. In verse 10, So the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight, on the plains of Jericho. So they have a celebration. Once again, there's an act of devotion, an act of remembrance that is performed. They partake in Passover, which once again is to remind them of their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. If you're going to be used by the Lord, you need to return to the first things. If we're going to be used, we need to take strength and hope in what God has done in the past. We need to remember how God has moved on our behalf. We need to remember his goodness and his power, how he has moved and worked and how he has done wonderful things. Passover was to remind them that he had delivered them from uh, Egyptian bondage. And so they celebrated Passover and remembered his goodness. They remembered the power that he had already shown them. And there's a good thing in remembering what God has done in, in the past in your life. There's a scripture in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, that says, 
Uh, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. To look back at what God has done. When you celebrate communion, you remember what Jesus has done. You remember how he has met you. And in your spiritual life, there are times that you need to look back at those stones of, of remembrance, those places where God met you. There are ordinances and things that you can enjoy that remind you of what God has done. And uh, if you're going to be somebody used by the Lord, you need to remember what God has done and yet move forward to what God still wants to do. Now it says in verses 11 and 12, they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Now the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. God had supplied for them this bread from heaven. It's called manna. Manna means what is it? It was like coriander. It was very sweet to the taste, and, and God had, had uh, miraculously provided for them so that they had no hunger. And as they were there in their journey, they were always provided for. But now that they're entering into the promised land, God begins to give them permission to live off the produce of the land that he has provided for them. And so in verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, what's up? No, he said, went up to, <laughs> where are you from, man? No, he, he said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I've now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your saddle off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua. This is the commissioning of Joshua. Even as Moses had spoken to the Lord when he was called, Joshua is now receiving his call. Now notice what it says here. Joshua sees someone with a drawn sword, and uh, he's a general. He, Joshua is the general. And as the general, he sees someone with a, with a sword drawn, and he, he approaches him in order to confront him. When I was in the military, uh, we were trained that uh, when you encounter a potential enemy, that you're supposed to tell them to identify themselves. Um, the, they were what we called the general orders. You had to memorize them, and you had to be able to give these general orders whenever somebody asked, what's the sixth order, what's the fifth order, what's the eleventh order? You had to be able to do that out of basic training. I believe that you have the same thing in boot camp in the Marine Corps and Navy and all. It's the general orders. And so we had to memorize them, and, and I still remember that, that they had us memorize certain, certain orders called general orders, and the eleventh general order was like this, you're, you're to challenge all persons on or near your post and do not allow any to pass. And what you will do is you will see them and you will say something. I know I have veterans in here. You will say, halt, who goes there? Identify yourself. That's what Joshua is doing here. Halt, who goes there? Identify yourself. He's actually doing military protocol. When he sees someone with a drawn sword, he doesn't recognize him as the general. He approaches him, and he challenges him. That's what he's doing. He's a military man, and he's challenging him. That's not always the safest thing to do. I remember in basic training, we had to walk sentry. We had to uh, walk around and uh, the barracks and um, in case somebody would intrude. Intruders would come. Sometimes they would come into your barracks, and they would, uh, they would rob you and things like that. And so you actually had to have sentries. And so I had to pull guard duty, called the guard duty. I, had, I was posted as a sentry. And I, I can still remember, um, they would give to us an ax handle. And you would walk around with this ax handle out there in the middle of nowhere. You're afraid. I have to be honest with you, man. I, I was afraid. 
And I'm carrying this axe handle around, and I'm praying for the hours that I had to walk out there. Jesus, you know, Jesus, don't let anybody come. I was in my bunk, and I heard a guy outside my window yell, Halt! Who goes there? Identify yourself. And then I hear this other guy answer him say, and he said something like, Oh, shut up. And so the guy says, Halt! Identify yourself. And the guy says, Shut up. Mind your own business. Then I hear the guy who's given the order take that axe handle and pop the guy with it. You can hear it go pop like that. And then what happened? I didn't see it. I was laughing too hard. Um, the guy must have taken the handle from him. And you could hear the guy who had been just a moment before yelling, halt, who goes there, you know, identify yourself. All I could hear was him going, ow, 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 as the guy was pounding him with his axe handle. It can be dangerous. <laughs> I just said, man, go on in. I don't, you know, I don't care. Go on in, you know, just don't hit me. Um, I don't know those guys. Um, Joshua. That's basically what he's doing here. He sees an intruder. He approaches him and he asks him a question. Are you on our side or are you on our adversary's side? Whose side are you on? Now, what's interesting is the way this guy responds. I want you to see this. When he says in verse 13, are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14, so he said, no. That doesn't make any sense the way I speak English. That's not how you're supposed to answer that. And yet he says, no. What do you mean, no? Well, I'm not on your side. I'm not on your adversary's side. The fact of the matter is, I'm on God's side. I'm not taking the side of man. I am here to enforce what God would have done. The one who's being spoken to here is not just an ordinary man. He's not challenging a man. He is challenging someone greater than a man. What is happening here is you're having something that is called a theophany or a Christophany. It is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. It's before Jesus Christ takes upon himself human flesh in his incarnation. This is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. It's called theophany, a God appearance. It's also called Christophany, a Christ appearance. I prefer using the term Christophany because this is an appearance of Jesus Christ. What he is doing is he's speaking to Jesus Christ in pre-incarnate form. And Jesus is the commander of the hosts of the Lord. You see in Old Testament, I could give you quite a number. I'll just give you a few. You can see instances in the Old Testament of this kind of thing, these Christophanies um, from Genesis following. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 33. Abraham has a conversation with a man who is actually God. And in that passage, Jesus shows up. He, he spends time with Abraham. He discusses details about the fate of Sodom. But it's the Lord who's speaking to him, not an ordinary man and not an angel. In Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32, I mentioned earlier Jacob. Jacob had a wrestling match with what is referred to as the angel of the Lord. I mentioned how the angel touched his hip. And Jacob ended up realizing that he had wrestled with God. In Genesis thirty-two thirty, he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. In the book of Daniel, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're a VeggieTales person, it's Rack, Shack, and Benny. And, and, and they, they <laughs> some of you have listened to that, huh? I have grandchildren. And uh, they refuse to worship the golden image. They're thrown, as we know, into a fiery furnace, but there is a fourth man who appears, and Daniel 3.25 says, his appearance is like a son of the gods. Isaiah chapter 6 records Isaiah actually seeing a pre-incarnate Christ. He sees Jesus. He has a vision in 
In the year that King Isaiah died, he said, I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. And so he exclaims, my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And in John 12, 41, John says, these things Isaiah said when he saw his, speaking of Jesus, when he saw his glory and spoke of him. And so what you have here is you have a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And he's the commander. He's powerful. He's majestic. He's awe-inspiring. And he is intimidating and when he says who he is, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Notice the response. It says he fell down on his face to worship. Now, if this were not God, then what Joshua is doing is wrong, should be judged, because worship is reserved for God alone. And this commander would not have received his worship. He would have rebuked him because you see that you see it in Acts chapter 10 when when Cornelius, the centurion, has invited the apostle Peter to come and to see him. You see that when Peter enters into his home, that Cornelius falls down at his feet in front of him to worship him. And according to Acts 10, 25 and 26, Peter says, stand to your feet. I'm but a man. You see the same thing when John, the revelator in, in the book of Revelation, when he falls at the feet of the, the angel there in Revelation 19, verse 10, as well as Revelation 22, verse 9, he falls down and he worships. And, and he is told, this is not what you do. Your worship is reserved for God alone. And so this tells me that this commander of the army of the Lord is not simply an angel. This is God in, in, in a human appearance. And that's why he falls down on his face to the earth. That's why he worships him. And that's why he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And verse 15 says, Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. What would you command me to do? What do you have for me? Take your sandal off your foot. What does that mean? Remove from yourself your love for the world. Remove from yourself the pollutions of the world from your soul. Consecrate yourself to me. Your shoe reminds you of the fact that you walk. You use shoes because you walk. What God is saying is I want you to remove the pollution from your life. Do you want to be used by the Lord? I do. I do. If you want to be victorious, if you want to be used by God, you need to be called, consecrated, established, obedient, and ready. And ready. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he realized that he was a man of unclean lips, and he said, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. An angel took a coal from the, from the fire and placed it on his lips, purified him. God said, who can I send? Who will go for me? And then Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. Send me. Have you done that lately? Have you done that lately? Here am I, Lord. Send me. Why can't he send you? Why can't he use you? Why? What is there keeping him from using you in a wonderful way? What is it? Is it worth it? Is it worth not being used by God? I have to tell you, the most the greatest and most joyful thing that I do is serve Jesus Christ. I have to tell you, that's the truth. The most fulfilling, pleasing thing that I do is serving the Lord. The greatest joy and peace and, and, and love and satisfaction comes from serving Jesus Christ. I had enough of the world. I had enough of the drinking. I had enough of the drugs. 
I had enough of the anger. I had enough of the materialism. I had enough of the garbage. Who needs it? Who needs it? I was in Monterey at the Pop Festival in 1970. Used to have Pop Festivals. I don't even know if they still do. Monterey Pop Festival, 1970. I had dropped Magic Mushroom. And I had been smoking pot. I was 20 years old. And I was walking through the festival when a guy, a woman, a man, a woman, young man, young woman, and a little boy, probably about four years old, they were long, they were hippies with long, stringy blonde hair. I still remember them. The little boy had long, stringy blonde hair like his mom and dad. They had made clothing out of sheets, white sheets. The woman had a granny dress. They used to call them granny dresses. Now a granny dress is what Marie wears, but they were granny dresses. <laughs> it's true. And uh, the guy was wearing a shirt, kind of was a flowing shirt, and, you know, just the pants that, they, that Tommy Bahamas now makes, um, the linen look. They were barefoot. The little, little kid had a sheet that had been cut like a robe. And they walked by me. And when they walked by me, a thought hit me. I'll never forget it. And the thought was, that's your future. That's your future. You're going to end up with somebody. You're going to have your kid. You're not going to have two nickels to rub together to put shoes on your feet. You're going to have to take whatever people throw away and try and make that into clothing because I wasn't working because hippies didn't like to work. I did not like to work. So I never would have provided for myself. I never would have provided for my family. I would never have provided for a wife. I'd have never had any of those things. And I don't know that the Holy Spirit was speaking my heart at that time yet to convict me. I would like to believe that it was one of the ways that God was using to draw me to himself. Because that wasn't a thought that was original with me. That was something that came from outside of me, not inside of me. I never thought that before. I never thought about it before. And I saw and I looked and I said, that's me. That's what I'm going to be like. If I keep doing these drugs and I keep drinking like this, that's what I'm going to be like. That's my future. It just walked in front of me. And it, I, it affected me so much that I didn't smoke pot for a day. That's the truth, man. I went to my friends and I said, man, I put down, man, I put down. I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. Really? Oh, come on, man. No, I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. And I didn't all day. And I did the next day. That was a hard day. I used to smoke pot almost every day. I look back at those times and I say, that's a different man. That's a different life. That's a different world, a different way of thinking. Because it was. Because I didn't know Jesus. And when I got saved at 20, everything changed. And that's when I began to learn some of the lessons I'm trying to encourage you to. If you want to be used by God, consecrate yourself to him. Here am I, Lord. Send me. I want to be used by you. I want to talk about you. I want my life to count for something. I want to leave a mark. I want to do something that people will remember. I want to be used by by you. And I started praying that at the age of 20 when I got saved. And I pray that to this day. I want to be used by you. I don't want anything in this world to drag me from the place of being used to a place of being set on a shelf. I encourage you guys, learn the lessons of Joshua. If you want to conquer, be consecrated. Be consecrated.